I would like to call this uh, hearing to order this morning. Uh, I might say that this is the 17th day of hearings that we've had on energy in America. Frequently, President Obama in his speeches talks about America having only 2% of the world's proven oil reserves. Today, we're going to discuss how Canada took action to increase its proven reserves several fold by allowing the development of oil sands in Alberta. We know that in Canada and in the U.S. there have been many groups that have opposed uh, additional oil production in both countries, but Canada faced that situation and as a result, as I've indicated, dramatically increased their proven oil reserves. As a result of that, those of us in America, or many of us, are going to continue to advocate for the Keystone XL Pipeline expansion project that could bring an additional 700,000 barrels of oil a day to Midwestern and Gulf Coast refineries from Canada. The benefits in terms of additional secure oil and thousands of jobs is simply too important for us to give up on. I, for one, would like to see more oil, Canadian oil flowing into America. I would also like to see the same type of pro-energy agenda in America that made oil sand production possible in Canada. There is a bountiful supply of untapped oil reserves here in the U.S., but frequently it's too bottled up with federal access restrictions and regulatory red tape. And I believe this needs to be changed. And the development of oil sands in Canada provides many lessons for us here in America. In spite of regulatory obstacles to additional development and production in the U.S., we do see signs of the can-do spirit in America. For example, new drilling techniques pioneered in the U.S. have turned North Dakota into a major oil-producing state. But that was possible only because it was developed on private lands, not federal lands. In the vast areas of America where we have public lands and oil in those areas, uh, the Obama administration has been reluctant to give the go-ahead for additional exploration and production in those areas. I'm sure the Canadian people care about the environment every bit as much as we do in America. And they have insisted all along that oil sands production be done in an environmentally safe way. We will learn today about the successful efforts to reduce environmental impacts from oil sand even as the production of oil sands increases through technology. The difference is that Canadian regulators seek to make energy production safe, while the Obama administration regula regulators often seek to make it impossible to do. That is why Canada's oil sands is nearly as valuable as an example of energy policy done right as it is for the oil itself. America can and must increase its domestic energy production, and there is much that we can learn from the Canadian experience, and I look forward to the testimony of all of our witnesses today on that very subject matter. This time, I'd like to recognize the gentlelady from Florida, Ms. Castor, for a five-minute opening statement. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to the witnesses uh, who are here today. Uh, today, we're having a hearing on tar sands and we're going to hear testimony about uh, how the production and use of tar sands fuel uh, exacts a very heavy toll on uh, the environment and on uh, communities, whether it's impacts to water quality or uh, strip mining uh, or uh, the very serious carbon pollution. Uh, this is this is dirty stuff. Can't, do we have the technology to address these issues? It is not clear at this point that uh, we should be going gangbusters full speed ahead uh, until we really can address 
the economic and environmental impacts of tar sands. Um, as one of our witnesses will testify today, from the production well to the wheels of a car, tar sands fuel is estimated to generate about 23 percent greater carbon pollution than conventional oil. These are very serious issues, and we need to get ahead of them and not uh, stick our heads in the sand, so to speak, and play ostrich with this. This could be very beneficial uh, for our energy production strategy. But it can't come at such a high cost that communities suffer, uh, the, environmental, the environment suffers, that we pollute our water, we pollute our air. Uh, one of the worst impacts uh, could be to, to the climate. And colleagues, we have a responsibility to understand uh, the impacts to uh, the world's climate because climate change does threaten our public health, it threatens our economic security, it threatens our agricultural production and our national security. Uh, those are just some of the threats uh, posed by climate change. And in some ways, this hearing is a first step. We're finally hearing about how much more carbon intensive tar sands fuel is. And we're hearing about some of the technologies that could be used to reduce that carbon pollution. If we are really serious, if the United States and Canada are really serious about reducing those impacts. Uh, there, there are other very serious issues. I know process isn't all that exciting, but we need to be mindful that we'd have uh, very important pipeline systems all across this country uh, and, and throughout Canada, and they work well. But what's the difference here? They've been subjected to uh, appropriate uh, environmental review and they've been subjected to uh, certain safety standards. And I'm afraid the majority party's uh, push to override those considerations will eventually come at the detriment of our communities uh, throughout both countries. So we have a responsibility to follow the law and not override uh, these important environmental laws and uh, community safety laws that every other business has been subjected to. Uh, it's also, uh, I'm also at a loss, frankly, that throughout the, the entire 112th Congress, the majority of this committee has made no effort to consider a comprehensive energy strategy, one that puts everything on the table, uh, one that really, that seriously examines uh, the, the proper places to invest for a truly diversified energy supply. Until we do that, these issues will continue to be debated, debated pipeline by pipeline and coal plant by coal plant, and that really doesn't make sense. Uh, it's, it's past time for this committee to examine these issues with the seriousness they deserve. I yield back. This time I recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Shimkus, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for calling the hearing. It's good to continue to talk about energy security and lower price crude oil, lower price gasoline. Uh, decrease in our alliance from Iran, decrease in our alliance from the Strait of Hormuz, uh, countries that dislike us, and looking north to our friends and allies, the Canadians, who I would make a point that it, are no better environmental stewards than any country on earth. And so let me start by, I've got a couple slides on, based upon my, my trip uh, first, I'm going to put up uh, an, uh, the pipeline issue that I addressed at a hearing before. Look at all the pipelines we have in this country today. Uh, why do we have pipelines in this country? Because it's the safest, most secure way to transport liquid product, whether that's crude oil, refined product. If you've ever been to a refinery, we have, uh, we have, you don't see trucks going in and out because pipelines bring in the crude. Pipelines send out the broken up component parts of the refined product. And that's, and in the last time we talked about the numerous pipelines we already have against across the Canadian US border, also on the Mexican border. Next slide. Caterpillar, a great US company, one of our largest exporters, relies on Canadian oil sands mining for building these great pieces of manufacturing. We talk about manufacturing in this country. That's manufacturing. Uh, the tires are Michelin tires made in South Carolina. Uh, we're um, proud from Illinois. 
and I'm proud of Caterpillar and their ability to work in this operation. Next slide. Ford trucks, Ford 150 trucks all over Fort Murray. That's at uh, one of the oil sands mining operations. Uh, good American made, probably built by United Auto Workers. Uh, it's great to see you up there. Next slide. Traffic jams. If you've been to Fort Murray, it's a little podunk town. What well, was a little podunk town? Now you have traffic jams. And if you look to the left, those are two Harley Davidson motorcycles. Nice to see. American made products up in Canada. Next slide. That's a mining operation. And this is a good point. I want to put this up because what we're going to hear today is about a different type of oil sands recovery that creates a carbon footprint less than the California standard. Um, this is what you'll hear debated. You won't hear anybody talk about what we're going to hear testimony today about. Next slide. Uh, another mining operation. Uh, I'm, a, I'm from mining country in Illinois. I love surface mining. I love subterranean mining. Good jobs, uh, good salaries, good health benefits. Um, and I think that's the last slide. I wanted to have an in situ um, slide, but I think for most people it would be very disappointing. And hopefully we can get a slide up later on in the questioning, because if you see an in situ operation, what are you going to see? You're going to see a platform, maybe the size, a, a, a coverage area, maybe three football size long. You're going to see a couple buildings, and you're going to see pipes. That, that's all you're going to see. You're, you're, you're not going to see a Bigfoot. And, and you're going to see geothermal applications that create a smaller carbon footprint. And I'm not a big carbon guy, okay? I'm, if you follow my public testimony and my comments, it's climate change saying price and carbon, I'm not in that camp. But if you go in that direction, 80% of this oil sands recovery can be in situ. And that's what I hope my colleagues on the other side learn about today. The two different types of recovering oil sands, mining operations, in situ. 80% of the oil up there now is in situ. And it's in pipelines. And, it's, and there's no uh, footprint. So Mr. Chairman, great uh, to have the hearing today. American jobs, Canadian jobs, third largest oil reserves on the planet to our neighbors and friends, the Canadians, a democratic uh, country. If you look at the top 10, how many are free capitalist societies, free market ability to grab crude oil? Uh, the oil sands is one area. We need to work with our allies and friends of Canadians to recover that. It will decrease our reliance on imported cr crude oil and lower our prices. Thank you, and I yield back my time. Thank you, Mr. Chimkus. At this time, I recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Waxman, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, today's hearing will examine the production of fuel from tar sands, the technologies used in that process, and the environmental impacts of tar sands development. The Republicans and the oil industry will use this opportunity to call for building the Keystone XL tar sands pipeline and developing deposits of tar sands and oil shale in the United States. They will base these recommendations on two central claims. First, they will say that we can reduce gasoline prices by expanding production, including developing unconventional deposits such as tar sands and oil shale in the United States. And second, they will suggest that the environmental effects of developing tar sands are not that bad and getting better. My response is, don't believe them. Let's consider gas prices. It's a Republican article of faith that we can drill our way to lower prices at the pump. But as we heard at the recent hearing on gas prices, if we increase production, it's easy for OPEC countries to reduce production by the same amount. That's the definition of a cartel, a group of entities that coordinates to control prices. The fact is, we are drilling more, and prices are still going up. U.S. crude oil production is the highest it's been in eight years, 
and the U.S. has more oil and gas drilling rigs operating right now than the rest of the world combined. Net oil imports as a share of our total consumption declined from 57% in 2008 to 45% in 2011, the lowest level since 1995. But prices are still going up. In fact, Canada is the poster child for the point that more production will not free us from world oil prices. Canada has a huge tar sands deposit and is developing them at a breakneck pace. Canada is a net exporter. That means they produce more oil than they use. And I want to have uh, put up a chart that shows what has happened since 2000. Canada production and the net exports have increased steadily for the past 12 years. Canada has increased its crude oil production by more than 35 percent. Canada is producing so much oil that it now exports 70 percent of all the oil they produce. If everything the Republicans have been telling us is true, then gasoline prices in Canada should have plummeted over the last 10 years. But that's not what happened. Here's another chart I'd like to have up. And uh, this shows the U.S. and Canadian gas prices over that period. As you can see, U.S. and Canadian gasoline prices track perfectly because they are both driven by the same thing, world oil prices. In fact, Canada's gas prices are actually higher than our prices due to taxes. More drilling, building a new tar sands pipeline or developing oil shale has not reduced gasoline prices in Canada, and it won't in the United States either. But that's not the only fantasy we'll hear about today. We will also hear that the environmental harms from tar sands production have been minimized and will be solved by technology. In reality, the tar sands operation have, a, have vast and devastating effects on the land, water, air, and ecosystem. Canadian tar sands are produced in Albor Alberta's boreal forests. In the photo I'd like to have put up, you can see a pristine area before tar sands production begins. The landscape is beautiful. The air and water are clean. In a second photo I wish we could put up, uh, you can see the effects of tar sands production. The land has been turned into an industrial wasteland. The forests have become an open pit mine. Maybe some of this damage can be avoided. Technology can reduce environmental impacts, but that won't happen without stronger government regulation. I recognize that tar sands holds a large amount of oil, but it is a resource that should not be exploited without environmental safeguards that protect the land, water, and pollution, controls that stop the growing emissions of carbon and other dangerous gases. Until these problems are addressed, the oil in the tar sands is best left underground. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, at this time, I would like to introduce the witnesses uh, testifying uh, this morning. We appreciate all of you being here. We look forward to your expertise, and uh, we anticipate we will learn a lot from your testimony. Uh, first, we have with us Dr. Eddie Isaac, CEO, Alberta Innovates Energy and Environment Solutions. We have Mr. Anton Damer, uh, former director, Naval Oil Shell Reserve, U.S. Department of Energy. We have Dr. John Nenninger, who is president and CEO of Insolve Corporation. We have Mr. William McGaffrey, uh, president and CEO of MEG Energy Company. We have Mr. Murray D. Smith, who is president of Murray Smith & Associates. We have Mr. Simon Dyer, who is the policy director for the Pembina Institute. And then we have Ms. Melina Lubakan Massimo. I should pat myself on the back. For a climate and energy campaigner, Greenpeace Canada. So welcome to all of you. Uh, I'm going to call on each one of you to give a five-minute opening statement. And uh, on the front of the desk there, there's a little uh, instrument that will have different colors on it. It'll have uh, green, yellow, and uh, 
red, and when it gets to red, that means your time is up. But uh, so if you wouldn't mind looking at that periodically. But each of you will be given five minutes, and Dr. Isaacs will begin with you, so you'll, you're recognized for a five-minute opening statement. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for the And be sure and turn your microphone on if it's not. Um, I thought I did. Is this better? Uh, thank you again, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for the opportunity to address you. I hope that I can add value to the work of this committee. I've submitted a short briefing to the committee on what I wanted to address. I'll keep my remarks fairly brief. Uh, I want to introduce my organization. I want to speak to oil sands technology and the importance of innovation and collaboration. And finally, how this all ties to energy security. Uh, first, my organization, Alberta Innovates Energy and Environment Solution. We are f uh, one of four new provincial corporations launched by the Alberta government in January 2010. Uh, we serve as the technology arm of the Alberta government in energy and environment. We are suc a successor to two previous organizations. Stretching over 37 years, these organizations have been instrumental in creating the climate for commercial development of the oil sands. We invest or fund research and technology with industry, other governments, and international collaborators. U.S. organizations are our major collaborators, not only in oil sands, but also in cleaner coal development, in carbon capture, and renewable energy. I want to switch now to talk about oil sands technology and the importance of innovation. Um, heavy oil and bitumen are found in many places worldwide. Alberta has the largest global reserves of these hydrocarbons that are not under the control of the state. Technology has been critical to development of the oil sands resources. Many of the technologies we use today originated by comp companies operating on both sides of our border. The methods for in extraction, I think it's been mentioned, are generally mining and in situ. For in situ, uh, we use in situ for the deeper deposits. The major innovation in mining has been the development in the past 10 years of hydro transport. Instead of using a truck and shovel, the ore is transported by a pipeline from the mine face as a slurry with water. The oil separates in transit to the plant. This method is operated at lower temperature than conventional extraction, thus reducing energy intensity and greenhouse gases. With in situ methods are steam-based processes, cyclic steam stimulation, similar technology to what has been pioneered in California in the 1960s. Steam-assisted gravity drainage, which has been only in commercial operation for the, la for the past 10 years. New technologies are emerging that are poised to significantly reduce energy intensity reduce water use and greenhouse gases. These include steam solvent hybrid processes that is being applied at least by one company commercially today. Use of solvents uh, without steam, you'll be hearing about that from uh, Dr. Nenninger uh, and Ensolve is a good example of this type of technology. Electric heating and electromagnetic uh, heating technology is coming into use. Um, electromagnetic uh, uses uh, radio frequency to heat uh, the oil in the oil sands. These are early days for the electromagnetic heating technology, uh, which really does bring the know-how of the Harris Corporation in radio communication technology with the reservoir expertise of oil sands producer and is a great example of cross-border collaborative effort on a new innovative next generation technology. I also want to mention carbon capture and storage and the several billion dollar investments that are being made in four commercial size demonstration projects in Alberta. In addition to new transformative technologies, there is a critical need to focus on emerging innovations to decrease the impact of current technologies on the environment. A good example of the technology deployment action plan for an end to end solution for oil sand tailings. Uh, this project has brought together all of the oil sands mining companies, the federal and provincial government, as well as the key engineering technology providers working in the area. Not only are there 100 technologies being evaluated to chart promising pathways, but there is a complete 
an open knowledge sharing of pilots and demonstrations that have taken place and practices that have uh, taken place for the past 20 years. We've had a great deal of success in Alberta from a strong government industry partnership based on clear business case and well-articulated implementation strategy. This is also the formula for success, especially on the environmental front. In the resource sector, it takes 20 to 30 years to bring new technology to market, much longer than in other sector, and this increases the risk profile and the financial commitments required. The role of my organization is to work with industry to significantly reduce the time lag for innovation um, and the risk of adapting new technology, especially next generation technology. The final point I want to make is about energy, uh, energy security. Uh, Canada and the U.S. are the only developed countries that can dramatically increase oil production. Uh, the chairman alluded to the fact that uh, not only do we have oil from oil sands, but also increasingly from tight shell oil reservoirs, the Bakken type, found in North Dakota, Montana, Texas, California, and the Canadian provinces of Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and Alberta. Societal expectations are that in considering economic development, we do what is best for the environment. If we are to be successful on the environmental front, then technology will be the key. Uh, to put it in the form of a simple equation, energy security equals energy, economy, environment, and societal value. In all of these, technology and innovation is the glue, and government's role is to create the conditions that ensures that energy is available, accessible, acceptable, and affordable, or in other words, secure. Thank you. Mr. Damler, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Uh, um, it's a great pleasure and honor to me to share the podium today with Murray Smith from Canada. I think I'm the only U.S. citizen on the committee today. Uh, Murray was a leader in the orderly and progressive development of the Canadian oil sands. Would you mind moving your microphone just a little closer? Yep. Development has enabled Canada to be energy independent, a goal that has eluded our country since the 1960s. Today, Canada is our largest source of imported oil. Canada, Alberta, has increased their proved reserves of oil to 176 billion barrels, second only in size to Saudi Arabia. In comparison, the United States has approximately 22 billion barrels of proved reserves. We can learn from the development of the Alberta oil sands development. The first and perhaps the most important lesson might be to create a permanent program and decision-making process that promotes research, technology development, regulatory and statutory reform, and public education. Oil sands and oil shale share some distinct physical and developmental characteristics as both resources are unconventional and both resources are well-defined, aerially consolidated, and highly concentrated. We also, share, we also share a common beginning. Following the Arab oil embargo, there was a resurgence in interest and purpose in energy independence in both Canada and the U.S. in 1974. In 1974, the DUI prototype oil shale leasing program awarded two leases in Colorado and two in Utah, attracting $681 billion million in bonus payments. It seemed that as soon as development gained momentum, it came to an end in 1982 with the precipitous drop in oil prices and the realization that prices would not escalate as originally speculated. Exxon's colony project abruptly closed doors without warning an event that is popularly referred to as Black Sunday. Not until 25 years later, the passage of EPAC 05, did the U.S. government demonstrate any appreciable interest in U.S. oil shale resource. In the Energy Policy Act of 2005, the President and the Congress of the United States declared that unconventional fuels, including oil shale, and I quote here, are strategically important resources that should be developed to reduce the, the growing dependence of the United States on politically and economically unstable sources of foreign oil. Section 369H of that act directed the Secretary of Energy, in cooperation with the Secretaries of the Interior and Defense, to establish a task force to develop a plan to accelerate 
the commercial development of strategic unconventional fuels and initiate partnerships with Alberta and nations with oilshale resources. The task force report with recommendations was completed and forwarded to, to the President in February of 2007. Unlike Albert, the Alberta experience, the report was never implemented. No plan, no policy, no progress. We are grateful for a strong and reliable trading partner to our north, but we are still dependent on the import of close to half of our daily oil requirements. We still consume roughly a quarter of the world's oil supply, and we remain reliant on an increasingly competitive, unstable, and often hostile world oil market for our energy security. The United States is the custodian of the largest and most concentrated hydrocarbon resource on Earth, oil shale. Conservatively estimated to exceed 2 trillion barrels, it has the potential to provide millions of barrels of production per day if developed in a planned and prudent manner analogous to the Alberta experience. In the Green River Basin of Colorado alone, the USGS estimates that 800 million barrels could be produced, over three times the total reserves of Saudi Arabia. In spite of lack of national direction in oil shale development, there remains considerable activity in the private sector. The activities of 32 companies are summarized in the report, Secure Fuels from Domestic Resources, which is found on the web. Great progress has been made in limiting water utilization, increasing energy return on investment, and minimizing the environmental impacts historically associated with oil shale development. As history has proved, the only limitation to developing oil shale resources in the United States has been, firstly, economic, and secondly, access to the resource, 80% of which is on federal land. As oil prices range above $100 per barrel, the economics look increasingly attractive, and the technical evolution of both surface and in-situ te technologies are encouraging. The oil shale moratorium, established under the Hoover administration in 1930, remains in effect. Today, a handful of oil shale R&D leases have been parsed out by the Department of Interior. Another programmatic environmental impact statement has been published and is now in comments. A weak, disjointed, and affected process, unable to provide industry the surety of commitment on the part of the government to risk investment of billions. We need to plan for the development of this prolific U.S. resource as the Canadians plan for the successful development of the Athabasca oil sands. We have the mechanism through Section 369 of EPAC 05. Ironically, failure to perform the requisite planning and preparedness will inevitably lead us back to everyone's deepest fear, Black Sunday. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, I thank you once again and I look forward to working with you in any capacity in furtherance of national security and preparedness. Thank you. Dr. Nenninger, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman uh, Whitfield, Ranking Member Rush, I guess he's not here, and members of the committee. I am John Nenninger, CEO of a technology company called Ensol. I'm a Canadian who's had the great privilege of earning a doctorate in chemical engineering from MIT. My energetic and remarkably patient wife is an American citizen, born and raised in Kentucky, who also has a doctorate in chemical engineering. It's a great honor for me to be here today to discuss solvent-based oil sands extraction. Inexpensive oil or energy is good for the American economy, but the evidence of climate change is both compelling and terrifying. This is a profound moral dilemma. I believe that harm reduction is the most pragmatic option. In the oil sands, this means finding profitable ways to produce cleaner oil. The unsolved extraction process is an underground extraction process similar to steam, except condensing solvent provides the heat. The unsolved process produces a more valuable product for a lower cost because it's energy efficient and it does not use water. Although our laboratory results are very encouraging, Ensolve has not yet been tested in a reservoir. In comparison to steam, Ensolve is expected to reduce energy consumption by 85%, reduce 
well to tank greenhouse gases by 205 pounds per barrel, increase oil value by 23%, reduce capital and operating expenses by 30%, double the net back per barrel, triple the payout. Our field pilot is expected to produce first oil in April of 2013. As a scientist, I view extravagant claims with great skepticism unless they can be supported with compelling evidence. I don't have time to present our evidence today, but there is more detail in the written handout and on our website. We found that bitumen dissolution into solvent proceeds in a way that was quite different than what everybody had thought. Our observations have been independently confirmed by researchers at a number of different universities. Although there's been decades of experimental work on solvent, our results show that the previous interpretation of lab experiments was incorrect, and consequently the reservoir predictions were also incorrect. We developed a sophisticated apparatus and ran a series of experiments to measure chamber growth rates. Our experiments showed we could achieve oil rates at 100 degrees Fahrenheit that were three times faster than steam at 450 Fahrenheit. To make sense of our results, we assembled a database of every solvent experiment in the scientific literature. We were able to successfully correlate the literature data over a huge range of conditions, and our lab re results were exactly in line with the independent data from the literature. This gives us great confidence that our spectacular results are real and credible. It's early days for NSOL, so discussion of its economics are speculative. The commercial advantage comes from producing a more valuable oil at a lower cost. The oil is more valuable because it's de-asphalted, and the process capital cost is cut in half because there's no boiler feed, water treatment, and no steam generation. The net back for NSOLV of $52 per barrel is expected to be almost twice as high as SAG-D. The payout ratio, $6 of net back per dollar of investment, is three times higher than SAGD. Remarkably, we think these numbers are understated. The ability to operate modest temperature and pressure will help us access stranded bitumen resource that is currently uneconomic, including no man's land and the carbonates, which contain over 1,000 billion barrels. Now I'm going to talk about the environmental benefits. NSOLV does not use any water. That's a big deal. NSOLV reduces the energy consumption by 85% because the extraction takes place at 100 Fahrenheit instead of 450. The 85% reduction doesn't capture the entire story because the oil quality also makes it easier to upgrade and refine. We're building a $60 million field pilot to test the NSOLV technology in a reservoir setting. Suncor Energy has offered to host the pilot, including drilling the wells. Hatch has made major capital investments and is providing the engineering. We've received financial support for S Sustainable Development Technology Canada. I can't say enough good things about SDTC. Enbridge Pipelines has also contributed significant capital towards the pilot. The final item I want to talk about is safety. Safety is always at the top of our minds. The science tells us that we can achieve commercial extraction rates at modest temperatures and pressures. Overpressuring the reservoir is both unnecessary and economically undesirable. If a high temperature is needed at a lower pressure, the operator can always change to a more appropriate solvent. In summary, NSOLV produces a more valuable product for a lower cost because it's energy efficient and does not use water. I look forward to your questions and comments. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Uh, Mr. McGaffrey, you are recognized for a five-minute opening statement. Mr. Chairman, Congressman, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today about technology in the energy industry in Canada. I am Bill McCaffrey. I am the President and CEO of MEG Energy, and today I am here to representing In Situ Oil Sands Alliance. And this is a group of individual or in independent Canadian companies dedicated to the responsible development of the Canadian oil sands using in situ technology. The main in situ technology used today is steam assisted gravity drainage or SAG-D as it is called. And SAG-D is important because it is currently the most common commercially proven, pretty much the only commercially proven way to reach the deep reservoirs that contain 80 percent of Canada's total oil sands reserves. 
And just to put that into perspective, that represents about 140 billion barrels of reserves, roughly equivalent to the entire reserves of Iran. Now, SAG-D technology is pretty simple, really. It uses horizontal wells drilled from surface, and we drill down to about 1,000 feet below the Earth's surface. Once we reach the reservoir and complete the wells, we drill about a half a mile out, inject steam into the reservoir, and bring the heated oil and the water back to surface without, distrib without disturbing the forest floor. And from a well pad a fraction the size of this building, the subsurface equivalent of 95 NFL football fields can be accessed. This provides what is among the lowest ratios of surface disturbance to resource recovery in the oil, oil and gas industries anywhere in the world. About 90 percent of the water that is used to create the steam is recycled, with the portion we can't recycle returned to deep, non-potable reservoirs. There are no tailing ponds created, and it's essentially a closed-loop system. And going forward, one of the key research and development focuses is to reduce the amount of energy we need to produce a barrel of oil. That's critical because of both the emissions and costs associated with the energy consumption. One of the technologies we're currently applying alongside of the SAG-D is cogeneration, a very energy efficient process that produces both steam for our operations and electricity for the sale to the grid. And that electricity has a carbon footprint less than half the Alberta grid average, reducing greenhouse gas intensities in the province. And in 2011, just as an example, Meg's cogeneration contribution alone was equivalent to taking 80,000 cars off the road. That kind of benefit is continuing to grow as cogen replaces legacy plants that have reached the end of their useful life. In our case, when we factor in the benefits of cogeneration and efficient steam use, SAG-D can produce a barrel with a wells-to-wheels -wheels carbon footprint about 6 percent below the average U.S. imports. And as we look to the future, the industry is investing in many other innovative technologies, nearly all of which share the same common goal, and you'll hear that today, is to improve energy efficiency, it's to drive down emissions, and it's to increase resource recovery rates. And I underline one point. SAG-D is just 10 years old. It's a young technology. Uh, it's been in commercial operations for about 10 years. There remains, but the point out of it is there remains tremendous opportunity for innovation to further accelerate the strides we're already, that have already been made. Looking beyond resource recovery, we're, we're also working with Canadian and U.S. research groups on technology to customize our export barrels. The goal is to better align these barrels with the configurations of U.S. refineries offering significant improvements in, in refinery efficiencies and economics and the jobs that come with them. These technologies can also support more efficient life cycle fuel use. For example, barrels can be tailored to be an ideal feedstock in the creation of ultra-low sulfur diesel, a friendlier fuel option than many US, that many U.S. automakers are now targeting. Government can have a role in partnering with industry to encourage technology acceleration a topic I know other, several of the other panelists are talking about here. But I would also note that the government also has a necessary and a critical role as a regulator. While still maintaining the highest standards, we need to streamline the regulatory processes so that windows of opportunity to invest and innovate are not missed. And to conclude, innovation, collaboration, and regulatory efficiencies are all critical to our economy today and into the future. With the oil sands industry alone, the prize, for the, the prize for the United States is an increase in goods and services output projected to reach $45 billion a year by 2035 and the creation of nearly half a million American jobs in that same time period. And finally, I would just argue that our mutual, it's of our mutual interest in, economic, in terms of economic stability, environmental responsibility, and energy security to work together. The focus of this community, our committee on harnessing technology to realize these goals to me is entirely appropriate, and I thank you for the time today. Thank you. Uh, Mr. S Smith, you are now recognized for five minutes. Well, thank you, sir, and uh, hopefully, uh, members of the committee. And you have your microphone on. 
And as Canadians, let me uh, thank you for holding this hearing in March and not in July or August. <laughs> it's been my privilege to serve Albertans as Minister of Energy, elected position from 2001 to 2004. During that time, I was able to quantify and register the 176 billion barrels of oil sands resource, proven oil sands resource, with the U.S. Energy Information Agency. This move catapulted Canada's total, total proven oil reserves from less than 1.4% of the world's supply to over 15%. And we believe, as you've heard, that there are much, many more barrels to come. And only technology will unlock this resource. How did Alberta move from this? We started uh, from scratch, 1967, with a joint government-private sector consortium, and today's production levels of over 1.7 million barrels today is a compelling story of human will, initiative, and technology evolution. And it would not have been possible without significant contributions from US-based companies. Now, Alberta owns these resources and manage them, manages them on behalf of the citizens of Alberta. And today, some scant 50 years later, the oil sands is the largest investable resource in the world today, where private dollars can flow in from private companies into a jurisdiction that respects property rights and ownerships. Oil sands projects are carefully regulated on multiple levels and learning and improving operations all the time. Mine permits, facilities must go through extensive review before approval is granted. And after approval, construction and fabrication is carefully monitored with annual plans and developments submitted for mandatory approval. As the projects begin to produce, there's again extensive oversight. There are no reports of oil spills from oil sands reserves. As oil is produced and shipped, there are in place numerous monitoring programs, and uh, today this oil is shipped primarily to the USA. And a recent EIA report in February showed that retail gas prices in areas where oil sands oil is delivered, there in other regions of the USA, there's the difference in prices as much as 50 cents per gallon where there has been reports of Alberta oil in that region. And that is a, an EIA report. Throughout this period, technology innovations and continuous improvement have been keystones in oil sands development. Government policy including land sales, royalty and tax systems, and in some cases actual funding and partnership with industry have created a wealth creating, job generating engine over many years. In 1993, the oil sands had moved primarily from the production of two operators and production was 300,000 barrels a day. Government of Alberta royalty revenues had been suffering from low commodity prices. We had a government that had a deficit that exceeded uh, a revenue by some 25%. Debt levels were approaching $28 billion. We were one hundredth the size of this country. Oil sands investors asked for a level playing field, a generic royalty structure, and an accelerated tax recognition of their investments. They received no direct benefits unless they invested their money first. A tax on machinery and equipment was phased out. Royalty structures became based on a payout period. Royalty started low and as projects paid out, increased to 25% of net profit. Today, Mr. Chairman, oil sands royalties exceed those collected from all our natural gas production in the province of Alberta. So with this structure and investment, billions of dollars poured in. We increased production to 600,000 barrels per day by the time I got elected in uh, 1993. In 2003, the world became aware of this resource and it created a stampede of investment. It created technological innovation um, that basically has coined the oil sands as the world's engineering sandbox. Let me just give you one example. Williams is an active, respected, midstream gas USA company. They uh, have developed and have deployed a technology that reuses surplus gases emitted from the coking process that upgrades bitumen to a transferable form. As the gases are emitted from the coking process, Williams traps these gases. They then remove the propane, butane, and higher C5 gases for use and sale later in the gas stream. They return dry, clean-burning gas back to the coker. This elegant but simple process now removes over 300,000 tons of CO2 from the atmosphere each and every year. They have the potential to put four or more plants in that area, resulting in over some million tons per year in reductions. So as a former politician, Mr. Chairman, let me just outline the changes. 
We paid off our, we balanced our budget in 1995 after implementing the oil sands royalty program. All of our provincial debt was paid off in 2004. We'd never increased taxes. We, in fact, uh, uh, refunded cash to, uh, to the citizens of Alberta. We've doubled the medical research fund. We've doubled an Alberta ingenuity fund, and we've created a sustainability and capital plan that allowed us to go through the uh, difficult times of the last three years. In 2004, the book showed a stunning $68 billion turnaround from the dismal economic situation of 1993. Let me finish, Mr. Chairman, with two quick stories. 2005, 60 Minutes are at a special on, uh, on the oil sands. A 22-year-old trucker said he made $120,000 that year. At the end of the program, the CBS phone line system was so deluged with calls it crashed. Over uh, 1,500 Americans, ranging from truck drivers to nuclear engineers, phoned in. What did they want? Jobs. So let me uh, finish with a quote from our great neighbor to the, to the south, uh, Governor Schweitzer, Brian Schweitzer, who, uh, who realizes that production from uh, Alberta will, with, will be secure, reliable, non-geopolitical, reasonably priced energy. And he says, I do not believe that we'll ever have to send the National Guard to Alberta to protect our oil supply. Now, Alberta is the number one energy supplier to the USA, and the dialogue and the insight that your wisdom has shown in calling this committee meeting, Mr. Chairman, will be gained, that will be gained today is critical to maintaining that special relationship. Thank you for this opportunity to serve the House of Representatives. Thank you. Mr. Dyer, you're recognized for five minutes. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and uh, committee. My name's Simon Dyer. I'm the policy director with the Pembroke. Do you have your microphone on, and could you get it closer? I think it's on. Yeah. My name's Simon Dyer. I'm policy director with the Pembroke Institute based in Alberta, Canada. The Pembroke Institute is uh, Canada's nonprofit sustainable energy think tank. We focus on energy solutions through research, education, consulting, and advocacy. With a long history as the leading independent uh, expert on oil sands environmental pol policy and performance. We've participated in the regulatory process in Alberta for 20 years and conducted extensive research on policy solutions to current environmental problems in the oil sands. The biggest impediment to progress on reducing the environmental impact of oil sands development through the deployment of new technologies is the lack of regulatory policy to drive improved performance. All the major environmental accomplishments, such as dealing with acid rain, the hole in the ozone layer, and removing lead from gasoline were all driven by regulatory approaches that resulted in increased environmental performance and technological innovation in the industry. In the oil sands, however, little attention has been focused on the appropriate role of government in regulating environmental performance, and thus many of the environmental impacts continue to worsen today. My comments due to the short time will be focused on greenhouse gas pollution, though the same principles apply to other unresolved environmental impacts, such as tailings waste management, freshwater use, air pollution, and land and wildlife impacts. Over the last two decades, oil sands greenhouse gas emissions have more than doubled. In 2009, oil sands operations in Canada emitted 45 megatons of greenhouse gases. According to recent projections by the Government of Canada, this is set to double again by, by 2020. What is less well known is that oil sands greenhouse gas emission intensity, that is how much carbon dioxide per barrel produced, has actually worsened over the past six years. This has undone some of the improvements in emissions intensity that other presenters have mentioned. Improvements since 1990 were largely driven by one-time changes like switching fuel from coke to natural gas and by incorpor incorporating cogeneration into projects. The insinuation that these kind of improvements will continue into the future is not supported by the evidence. The worsening emissions profile of the oil sands can be attributed to three main issues. Firstly, an increasing proportion of oil sands production will be coming from in-situ oil sands development, as noted by other speakers here today. In situ development produces two and a half times more greenhouse gas emissions per barrel than oil sands mining does. Secondly, as oil sands development increases, companies are exploring lower quality and harder to access bitumen resources, and developing these resources means increased environmental impacts per barrel. Thirdly, the very weak regulatory environment for greenhouse gas management in Alberta and Canada does not require substantial improvements in greenhouse gas emissions. As you may know, the Government of Canada has repeatedly failed to meet its own targets to reduce greenhouse gas pollution, and the oil sands are the major reason behind this. While most industries in Canada are holding steady, emissions in the oil sands continue to rise. A 2010 MIT study quantified this effect with economic models and concluded that the niche for the oil sands industry, in the oil sands industry seems fairly narrow and mostly involves hoping that climate policies will fail. 
In Canada, hitting climate targets while the oil sands expand dramatically would mean asking every other sector in our economy to do more than their fair share, a prospect that's so unappealing that every Canadian environment minister to date has opted to miss our targets instead. Much attention has been played to the potential role of carbon capture and storage, or CCS, in limiting greenhouse emissions from the oil sands. Indeed, Alberta's climate plan says CCS alone will account for 70% of Alberta's reductions by 2050. However, there are no operating CCS projects in the oil sands. One planned integrated project, Shell's Quest project, proposes to capture 1.2 million tons of emissions from the Stockford upgrader. This project will receive $865 million in subsidies from the Alberta and federal governments. While in principle, CCS could be applied at different stages of the oil sands, it's not economic under current policies. Carbon capture costs for oil sands projects range from $75 to $230 per ton of carbon dioxide. In Alberta, the effective carbon price is only $15 per ton of, carbon of CO2. At this price level, in the absence of further massive public subsidies, there will be no deployment of CCS in the oil sands beyond Shell's Quest project. Unfortunately, Alberta's climate plan states that 30 megatons of annual reductions will be derived by CCS by 2020, the equivalent of building 25 Quest-type projects in the next eight years. Clearly, this is a fiction. For carbon capture to be economic, governments would either have to implement carbon prices an order of magnitude higher than they are, are currently, or mandate carbon capture and storage for the oil sands industry. In December, Pemin Institute conducted the first assessment of Alberta's climate plan. We concluded that Alberta will miss its emissions target by two-thirds. We characterized Alberta's climate plan as a car, car without an engine. It has many of the elements that could be effective, but without a meaningful carbon price, it just won't run. The current frenzied rate of oil sands development in Canada is a symptom of our failure to implement policies and regulations to meet our commitments. Rosy projections of oil sands expansion are simply mathematically inconsistent with these commitments. I'd like to finally comment on the fact that Pembina Institute is supportive of voluntary measures and research and development by oil sands industry. Though it's important to distinguish between lab research and small-scale pilot projects and commercial penetration of new technologies, the commercial application of new technologies is simply not keeping pace with this expansion and the vast majority of new production will rely on conventional, more polluting technology. This represents a significant opportunity lost and can only be addressed through policy and regulatory intervention. Thank you very much. I look forward to your questions. And thank you, Mr. Dyer. And Ms. Lubican Massimo, uh, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Good morning, Chair and Committee. My name is Melina Lubican Massimo. I come from Northern Alberta, Canada. I am a member of the Lubicon Cree First Nation, which is one of the many communities impacted by tar sands development. For, us, uh, for those of us in Canada who are experiencing the detrimental effects of tar sands, it is encouraging to see that many decision makers and citizens in the United States are beginning to ask questions around whether or not the tar sands are in the right direction in which we should be pursuing in an already carbon constrained world. In the past five years, I have worked in communities throughout Alberta and British Columbia that are very concerned about the approval of tar sands pipelines, not only because of potential spills, but also because it will increase pressure to, for more tar sands expansion in Alberta. I personally have felt the impacts of both pipeline spills and tar sands driven industrialization of the landscape in the north. Last spring, I returned home where I was born to witness the aftermath of one of the largest spills in Alberta's history, which was 50% larger than the oil spill in the Kalamazoo River in Michigan. What I saw was a landscape forever changed, where my family went fished, hunted, and trapped for generations. Days before the federal or provincial gover ed government admitted that this had happened, my family was sending me messages telling me of headaches, burning eyes, nausea, and dizziness, asking me if I could find out more information as to if it was an oil spill and how big it might be. This is, was one of the saddest and most frustrating points because my family was not the first nor the last to experience these effects. It was alarming to hear that the first phase of the Keystone had already leaked and spilled 14 different times in its first 12 months of operation. Where I come from, billions of dollars are taken out of our traditional territories, yet till this day my family still has no running water. The indigenous communities have lived in these regions for thousands of years and yet are being pushed out, unable to access their traditional territories and unable to practice their treaty rights due to tar sands expansion. This is a violation of our constitutionally protected rights under Section 35 of the Canadian Constitution. Communities like Fort Mackay, First Nation, can no longer drink, from, drink the water from their taps. 
and their children are developing skin rashes from bathing in this contaminated water. A cancer study done by Alberta Health Services revealed that there was a 30% increase in the community downstream of Port Chippewan. Leukemias and lymphomas were increased by threefold, and bile duct cancers increased by sevenfold. Almost all of the cancer types were elevated that were elevated were linked to scientifically, scientifically um, in scientific literature, to chemicals in oil or tar. We have toxic tailing ponds sitting in the north of Alberta that span over 170 square kilometers, which is equivalent to 42,000 acres. This is, the real, this is the reality in Canada, and more specifically, in Alberta, we have a lax and failing environmental monitor system, which has little to no enforcement when it comes to the tar sands. There have been thousands of alleged contraventions, notifications, and releases with little to no evidence of enforcement, as seen in a database that from Alberta Environment Documents, which details incidences of license and unlicensed discharges, discharges of pollutants, tailing leaks, chronic acute pollution incidents, habitat destruction, failure, and failure by industry to maintain monitoring equipment, pollution, and um, government documentation of reclamation and chronic lack of enforcement. We have endured decades of promises that have taught us that promises of new technologies um, that will repair this damage are, feel like empty words. The reality is that SAGD solutions um, usually move the problem elsewhere, such as pumping the toxic byproduct underground um, where they can leak into aquifers rather than storing them in tailing ponds from the mines. Meanwhile, the scale of production is increasing and the overall problems are getting worse. We have, seen the we have not yet seen a cumulative environmental assessment overall in the tar sands. But, and so companies will, and the government is, is therefore passing these projects um, without this cumulative environmental assessment. Companies will leave irre irre irreparable damage to our lands and our homes. And the Alberta government claims to reclaim the land. However, many prominent scientists dispute that this is possible. Just last week, a report was published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of the Sciences of the United States of America, stating any suggestion that oil sands reclamation will put things back to the way they were is greenwashing. First Nations in British Columbia are also adamant that, their, that the Enbridge pipeline will not be built through their territories. Over 100 First Nations have signed on to this declaration to oppose the construction of the Enbridge pipeline and its associated supertankers on the west coast of Canada, and First Nations are willing to pursue litigation if the Enbridge pipeline is approved in Canada as they have constitutionally protected rights under section, thir section 35 of the Canadian Constitution. If constructed, the Keystone XL would deepen our mutual addiction to dirty oil and enable the ongoing expansion of the tar sands at the expense of communities as well as, as, well as at the expense of advancing cleaner energy alternatives. You have a choice in the direction we are taking in the world. You have the opportunity to become the world, the world leaders in clean, renewable energy solution that meet our energy needs without undermining or sacrificing the health of our communities and ecosystems. Hi, hi. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and thank all of you for your thoughtful testimony. And at this time, we'll have periods of questions uh, for, for the panel, and I'll recognize myself for five minutes, uh, and then we'll go to the other members. Got this. Uh, first of all, Mr. Smith, uh, you uh, were the Minister of Energy in Canada for a number of years, is that correct? Uh, that's correct. I was the Minister of Energy for the province of Alberta, which owns the resource and mm -hmm. manages them on behalf of all Albertans. And how would you describe the government of Alberta's approach to leasing land for oil sands development? What happens, uh, Mr. Chairman, is that if there is no record of uh, development after a lease has been purchased uh, um, in an open auction type uh, format, then that lease reverts back to the Crown and it, it is in fact resold. So um, that way it's a, it's a clear process, it's a transparent process, and it's one that's been free for corruption from the, for the last 70 years that it's been, been in place. Well, would you characterize Alberta as being encouraging development or being an obstacle to, to development? Well, I don't think this, uh, the government that I was involved with, Mr. Chairman, many, many made any secret out of wanting to generate employment, create jobs, create prosperity and wealth uh, for the province of Alberta. That province, uh, the time I was elected at 2.5 million, now has 3.7 million people. It has uh, the, consistently 
the lowest unemployment across Canada, consistently the highest average uh, earnings. Uh, the oil sands itself has created more jobs for Aboriginal and First Nations people uh, in Canada than any other place in, uh, uh, in, in Canada today. Um, the oil sands um, have three, fall under three areas in the government, uh, regulator, policymaker, and royalty collector. So you're always in a dynamic tension of dealing with those, those three matters. Um, they're, uh, they're making great progress. Um, I've seen uh, reclamation of mine sites, Mr. Chairman, where the company went to the elders of the First Nations. They asked what would they like in reclamation. And in fact, uh, they uh, created a buffalo herd. That buffalo herd that is on there today uh, has a herd of about 300 with a 99% successful mm -hmm. calving rate. So if I describe the Alberta area as having an economic boom since this took place, would that be accurate or not? Absolutely. Accurate, okay. Now, we've had a number of hearings on Keystone Pipeline, and those people who are opposed to it, I think I can characterize their uh, description of oil sands production and so forth as, as being inherently uh, dirty and inherently more risky than other types of oil. Would you agree with that characterization, Mr. McGaffrey? Is your microphone on? Uh, no, I wouldn't. I, um, when we look at our greenhouse gas emissions that we have relative to other U.S. imports, I think we've made great strides on it. It doesn't mean we can't continue to do better, and that's what we're doing. We're focusing that on energy efficiency, and some of the things that we're working on right now in areas of technology are very exciting, but no, I, I wouldn't agree with that. Okay. Uh, Mr. Dyer, in his testimony, made this comment that in situ extraction had significantly more greenhouse gas intensive means it was a intensively more produced more greenhouse gases than other methods of extraction and he said on average 2.5 times more intensive than mining as far as greenhouse gases uh, go would you and mr smith agree with that comment or not Actually, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Dr. Isaacs would probably be the best person to... Would you agree with that comment, Dr. Isaacs? Um, no, I wouldn't agree with that comment. Okay. Now, Mr. Dyer also said that, uh, it, it, that there's a weak regulatory system in Canada relating to production of oil sands. Would you agree with that uh, statement, Mr. Smith? Uh, no, I wouldn't... Uh uh, Chairman Whitfield, because uh, the Alberta recognizes that it has a great and vast resource and it must be developed in an orderly manner, and it must pay attention to environmental values and social values. Uh, it was the first province in Canada to have a Department of Environment. It was created solely for the purpose of, of managing these resources. We have a quasi-independent, semi-judicial regulator that makes decisions on the development. It takes three and a half to five years to approve one SAG-D process. Uh, a mining project's been in approval over seven years. These panels are joint panels, federal, uh, federal, pa federal fisheries and oceans, federal environmentalist uh, departments, uh, they will share in the panels. Uh, it is a very highly regulated and public process. Thank you. My time has expired. At this time, I recognize uh, Ms. Castor for five minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all for your testimony. Uh, I'd like to keep on that line of questioning and uh, understand that in Alberta, you have an Energy Resources Conservation Board, uh, Department of the Environment, Department of Sustain Sustainable Resource Development. Uh, they all maintain very robust rules for uh, tailings management, land reclamation, uh, water pollution, groundwater monitoring. Uh, so because my time is limited, could you go down and just give me a yes or no answer? I think many of you have already stated this. Are those fundamental health, safety, and environmental uh, regulations important? Yes or no? Yes. 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 Without question. Yes. Yes. Well, the, see, the difference here in um, 
the great United States of America is that what the Republicans have tried to do is have this uh, Keystone Pipeline approved by passing a bill and giving short shrift to a lot of those health, safety, and environmental reviews, uh, really giving them special treatment by passing a law and not adhering to things like the National Environmental Policy Act and others, and that's not fair. All of these uh, entities should play by the rules. Uh, today, we have heard several witnesses testify about the ability of new technologies that attempt to minimize the impacts of tar sands oil development on uh, strip mining, on water pollution, uh, the lingering toxic chemicals in these large tailing ponds, uh, the decades of dealing with the solid waste uh, that's left over in carbon pollution. And it's important that, that uh, here in the United States we understand the impacts of the tar sands. Mr. Dyer, based on your study of the tar sands industry in Canada, have environmental impacts of the tar sands been significantly mitigated through the deployment of new technology? Well, I wouldn't take my word for it. I mean, I, if, if you look at the Roy Royal Society of Canada's report on the tar sands, which is the equivalent of your U.S. Academy of Sciences, uh, they concluded that uh, regulations haven't kept pace with tar sands uh, development. So uh, absolutely not. Uh, as was mentioned, there was an absolute boom in the oil sands, and it left regulators unprepared to uh, um, catch up with addressing Cuma's environmental limits in, uh, in the oil sands. Thank you. And how about you, Ms. Lubacan Massimo? Has technology fixed the environmental harms from tar sands production that are so devastating to the First Nation communities? In my opinion, no. Sorry. In my opinion, no, unfortunately, because what we're seeing are impacts to the land. We're seeing impacts to the, where, to, to the air and to the water. And so we, we've seen exceedances happen, in, happen from operations in that, that impact the communities downstream and that are around the communities. We've seen um, cattle, cattle ranchers actually have they think connected to the emissions have um, their cattle miscarriage because of things like where they're feeling quite ill from the inability for them to capture fugitive emissions. So it's impacting people and I don't feel like it's, it's doing its job. And in addition to the pollution of water and water quality issues, development of tar sands is a very water intensive process. It, um, so it impacts uh, water quantity. In fact, it takes as much as four barrels of water to produce just one barrel of bitumen from tar sands. And here in the United States, it's reported that we have rich deposits of tar sands and oil, share, oil shale in arid western states such as Utah and Colorado and Wyoming. Uh, Ms. Lubacan Massimo, can you speak to the impacts of tar sands development in all in Alberta on the local water resources. Go into a little greater detail on water quantity uh, requirements and water quality. Well, the, the area where we are, the Athabasca Peace River, Bas Peace Athabasca Delta, is a sixth of Canada's fresh water supply. So we are dependent on that water supply. Um, it's very important to us. So um, what we've seen is that industry has used this water as well. So we are somewhat at competing um, needs for it. Um, but the, the damage that we've seen happen to the downstream communities, um, you know, we're seeing, unfortunately, fish with tumors and such because of the contamination, but we're also seeing lower levels of water in the area. So I've talked to elders that, you know, used to boat down from community to community, and now they're hitting sandbars because there's, there's decreased level water levels in the areas, and that's very concerning um, for the scientific um, community where they're actually saying if there's decreased levels that will, you know, do a fish kill or a potential fish um, a depopulation of the areas. Um, so there's, there's definitely down, downstream impacts as well as for communities around that region as well. Thank you very much. This time, I recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Shimkus, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So much question, so little time. Uh, first of all, um, I did meet with the chief elder of the First Nation on my trip, and he, uh, although he was concerned about expansion, he did appreciate the, the hundreds of jobs, uh, thousands of jobs available to tribal members for uh, in these operations. Uh, I'm gonna put that on the table. And again. This Keystone debate is really kind of goofy because we only spent three years, three and a half years to study it. Um, ten federal agencies all approved it. EPA said it was okay. <laughs> so uh, it, for us, it just drives a lot of us crazy to hear these uh, really um, fallacious false statements about the, the entire uh, 
the entire process. Let me go briefly. I've got a couple pictures. I want, let's put the first one up. Uh, this is in response to my, my friend, Mr. Waxman. Uh, that, that's a recovered mine operation site. Now, I'm from southern Illinois. We had strip coal mining. Obviously, in the first days, not very good environmental stewards. We recover uh, coal mine operations now, and that's a picture of before and after of a recovered, reclaimed surface mining operation. Let's go to the next site because it really dealt with my, my opening stuff. We better start talking about the two different types of operation. For as much as the environmental left wants to keep beating us up, they are two different operations. And these three pictures show that. This is an in situ operation. Go to the next picture. That's the footprint. When it tails off, that's kind of the wells. Go to the next one. Of course, the little pipeline then to, to send the product. So um, I, I just need to put that on record. Uh, let me ask Dr. Isaacs, I have a quick question. You mentioned some uh, technology company, communications company. What company was that? Do you, uh, Melbourne, Florida, I think, right? Yeah. Big, so this is a big operation for them. Yeah. That, great. Uh, Mr. Danner, I, I just want to thank you for talking about the 2005 energy bill. We, I was on the conference committee, great piece of legislation, and I hope it help, helps us create op, additional operation in oil shell development. Uh, Dr. Neininger, when you're talking about your, oper, your, your new uh, operation, it sounds like you're putting uh, a chemical solution down to recover the oil sands. Is that correct? Um, most likely it's either condensing propane, which is okay. what you burn in your barbecue, or condensing butane. Um, and I, obviously you've been following our debate on fracking, and uh, you're doing a lot of research. Uh, should that, would you want to immediately disclose that list of, of operation uh, to anyone who wants to use that? Um, or would it be a proprietary information? N no, it's it's absolutely open. Good. We have technical papers on our website. We have 10, 15 patents. Great, so thank you. I got short in time. Let me go to Mr. McCaffrey. Mr. McCaffrey, you've listened to a lot of some of the statements. I'd like for you to address two issues. Um, uh, wells, no, wheels to well, carbon dioxide emission levels, and also I'd like to address this water issue that was raised, especially in your expertise on in situ. Sure. In terms of uh, wells to wheels analysis, um, we're focused on the energy intensity, and we have been successful in continuing to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions uh, throughout the last several years, and we have a target of continuing to reduce those. It's all focused on improving our energy efficiency and using novel technologies like uh, cogeneration, and then seeing what we can do to substitute out the steam as we go along through infill wells and the use of natural gas, which is just methane in the reservoir. We just continue. and you told me that that uh, process is actually lower than the California carbon standards. Is that correct? Absolutely. I think it's about 15 percent. Great. Can you now uh, move into the uh, water usage issue? Sure. Um, what we do is we, um, it's pretty much a closed loop, loop, uh, loop system where we recycle the water back and then, uh, or we bring the water back when it's produced, so it's condensed steam, drains down to the producer, we bring it back, we recycle it, and we use it over and over again. So this number of the use of water in your operation is not true? No. No, we, uh, we recycle 90%. Great, thank you. Um, Mr. Chairman, I'll return back 19 seconds. This time I'd like to recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Waxman, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. Since uh, last May, uh, this committee has held four hearings on the Keystone XL tar sands pipeline and passed two separate bills to mandate approval of that pipeline. And yet the majority has never bothered to examine the impacts of tar sands production and transport on public health and the environment. In particular, there has been no effort to understand what a shift to tar sands fuel would mean for U.S. carbon pollution. So today's hearing is long overdue. And it appears that most of the witnesses here recognize that tar sands pose serious environmental threats that must be addressed. For example, every witness on this panel has provided testimony about efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions 
from tar sands productions. One of the witnesses, invited by the majority, Dr. Nenninger, states that, quote, the evidence of climate change is compelling and terrifying, end quote. Another, Dr. Isaac, states that, quote, careful management of environmental issues, especially greenhouse gas emissions, is essential, end quote. Uh, Mr. Dyer, are the tar sands operations really getting cleaner in terms of carbon pollution, and if not, why not? In absolute terms, uh, definitely not. As uh, we demonstrated here, we're looking at emissions uh, doubling by 2020. And uh, in terms of uh, intensity, the evidence uh, suggests, suggests not as well. You know, this is government and industry data that says we've got a worsening trend in the past six years. Our data that uh, demonstrates in situ development is uh, more, in, more greenhouse gas intensive than mining is based on uh, industry data and uh, highlighted in our report, Drilling Deeper, the in situ report card. So I think uh, the data is quite clear that uh, in situ, based on its uh, requirements for steam, is more energy intensive than GHG intensive than mining. And that trend uh, is currently uh, outstripping uh, any potential improvements. Mm -hmm. Mr. Dyer. Uh, are there technologies available that could substantially reduce greenhouse gas emissions for tar sands production? Yes, there are, but uh, unfortunately, they're uh, they're expensive. And uh, you know, if you're uh, uh, making decisions about uh, whether to deliver, uh, you know, a, a responsible product that has low carbon emissions, uh, adopting expensive carbon capture and storage voluntarily is not going to happen. So I think we're in a situation where we have been facing other great environmental challenges in North America. If we're serious about uh, uh, cleaning up some of the worst aspects of oil sands development, we should be willing to regulate them. And uh, clearly the evidence is that Canada so far hasn't taken interest in, uh, in regulating uh, the oil sands. Uh, so there, there are no operating carbon capture and sequestration projects now. One is planned, as I understand it, but it's being heavily subsidized by the government. Absent such subsidies, the industry has no incentive to deploy technology. Is that right? That's correct. Uh, you know, there are dozens of uh, uh, projects in the regulatory queue currently uh, in, in Alberta, and uh, with the exception of the uh, Shell Quest project, which will be built using taxpayers' dollars, uh, none of those projects propose carbon capture and storage. Uh, Ms. Uh, Lovacan Massimo, what's your view? Does the industry rhetoric about the sustainable, sustainable development match up to the reality on the ground? In my opinion, no, it doesn't. Um, what we're seeing is massive mines the size of entire cities. When Imperial Mine is done, Pearl Mine, it will be bigger than Washington, D.C. Um, what we're seeing is a number of in-situ projects all over and all over the region. I'm from the Peace region, there's the Athabasca region, there's the Cold Leak region. This region in total takes up uh, the size of the state of Florida. We're talking about completely fragmenting or destroying a landscape the size of an entire state of the United States of the America. The industry and Alberta government talk a good game, but this is a classic example of greenwashing. The reality is that the carbon pollution from tar sands is growing very rapidly, and the Alberta government is not willing to put the policies in place that would be necessary to change that. One claim we've heard repeatedly about the Keystone XL tar sands pipeline is that if the U.S. doesn't take the tar sands crude Canada will just send it to China. Mr. Dyer, does Canada currently have the transport capacity in place the tar sands to send the tar sands to China instead of the U.S.? No, there is a, a small uh, pipeline that currently uh, goes to Vancouver, but there is a major proposed uh, pri pipeline, the Enbridge Gateway uh, project. That is facing uh, even more opposition, I would say, in my estimation, than the Keystone XL. Mr. Lobokan Massimo, is, it, is this pipeline going to happen? No, in my opinion, it will not happen. Over 100 First Nations are opposing this pipeline, and over 80% of British Columbia Columbians themselves actually oppose the super tanker traffic that would need to be associated with the tar sands pipeline. Thank you. My time has expired. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. At this time, I recognize the gentleman from West Virginia, Mr. McKinley, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Melina? Yes. Yeah. Hi. Uh, I'm just curious uh, if you could give me a little uh, insight. Um, do, do your group or something similar, do you support um, drilling for oil in the Gulf? In the Gulf? Well... Yes or no? Um, no. Okay, do, you dr do you support drilling in Anwar? Anwar, which is where? In, in Alaska. Oh, no. Do you, um, do you 
you support the Keystone Pipeline, the no, construction of it? Um, do you support surface mining for coal? Like mountaintop mining, for example. Well, I've been to Kentucky and I've talked to people from there and it seems like the repercussions are similar to the tar sands, so I'd say, in my opinion, the communities are being the sacrificed. Do you support the fracking technique to get to the um, gas shales, uh, like in the Appalachian Mountains or in Texas or wherever shale gas is located? Uh, is that something that, that your group would support? For fracking? For the fracking to get the gas out of the ground. No, so, okay, so. I'm really curious where you're going with this. Um, uh, you know where I'm going. Yeah, I, um, yeah. And that is that we don't want oil, we don't want coal, <coughs> we don't want gas, but yet we have a nation that depends on those, Those, but you're saying I'd, I'd, I want to use, I suppose, and it's fine, we're, I'm, I'm going to support the all of the above, the renewables. Okay. But I don't understand where you're <coughs> going because you're trying to ban this. Um, the, the technique that everyone's used up here has been very clever. Uh, the focus on the, the 20 percent that's in, not in situ. In situ, is clearly you've seen the, the, the pictures, how environmentally sensitive it is for that. But everyone seems to be focused, even from the folks on the other side of the aisle, been focused so much on the negative of, of surface disruption. But coming from the construction industry 45 years, I would challenge someone if they've not been on a golf course to see a golf course constructed. Uh, millions of cubic yards are disturbed mm -hmm. to have a golf course, but at the end of the day, everyone enjoys it. Uh, uh, surface mining, uh, I've seen them use then after the surface mine to use after the reclaim uh, for shopping malls, schools, penal institutions, numbers of it's, but you're, you, you just always look at the worst side of it. And that is during the construction. And again, coming from the construction, every, I don't think anyone ever likes a construction site during construction. But when it's all done, it's when, it, when it's reclaimed, it's something positive. Why are you so focused on the negative? Um, well, what I'm actually you're asking. not willing to use, you're not willing to get oil, gas, or coal. Yeah. Well, it's actually asking for more of a transition away from oil and gas and the associated greenhouse gas emissions that are causing issues worldwide. Um, we, we need to transition away from that and actually put our investments in renewable energy systems so we can actually have healthier communities. Okay, Mr. McCaffrey, if I could uh, go to you just for a minute. The, back um, uh, in May of last year, we had some testimony here in a hearing, and, and there were issues we were saying. I just like your comments that uh, they were given to us by, um, it said on a life cycle ba basis, tar sands may emit almost 40 percent more carbon pollution than conventional fuel. Would you agree with that? Uh, no, I wouldn't. Okay, there was a there was a another testimony on the same day that again, we've talked about pipeline safety because that, that a lot of the opponents are trying to indicate that they're, it's dangerous what we're doing. It says uh, there was testimony said including uh, that the the bitumen pipe high pressure, including internal corrosion, abrasion, and stress corrosion cracks only weaken pipelines over safety. And then it went on to say that Alberta's scorched earth tar sands operation are the most destructive sources of oil on the planet. Would you agree with those statements? Absolutely not. And the, back to Mr. Smith, can you, can you touch on just a little bit about the, 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 the revenue source? What impact uh, your revenue source has been on the nation uh, with Canada, the, what you've been able to facilitate in Alberta, is is that had a positive impact? Is that is that provided revenue to the to the country to, to get out of its own? Well, there are significant significant studies done by major um, and reputable economic groups across uh, across Canada and the United States that talks about uh, oil an oil sands barrel delivers more economic value uh, to the United States than any other barrel that you use, import, or derive. Uh, from in in the world today, um, remember uh, Shimk has talked about uh, Caterpillar and Michelin, uh, Chicago Iron. Uh, the the number of companies that are involved in the oil sands from here. Well, I, I know my time is just is essentially expired. But can you just share if you if we couldn't in America we couldn't mine coal, or can't burn coal, and we couldn't use oil or gas. What what do you think our role is as leaders? 
how long North America's we... economic recovery has always been based on reasonable and well, low-priced energy, energy costs, and we'll continue to be that way. Thank you very much. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, this time I recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Green, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And let me, for the record, correct. Uh, there were some statements made earlier by our ranking member that talked about um, the Keystone Pipeline was trying to be uh, get ahead of what's normally required for pipelines in our country. Uh, that's just not true. Uh, the Keystone Pipeline has had, you know, one environmental impact statement with two supplementals, and it was still approved by the EPA. So that's even more than the typical pipeline from Texas to Cushing, Oklahoma, that's uh, the southern leg of it that the President supports. So uh, there's been no exceptions. Uh, you know, when you have study for two and a half years on a, on a pipeline, you obviously are, are going to get a lot of reviews. And uh, so there have been at least one full environmental impact and sup two supplementals and approval by the EPA of the Keystone Pipeline. And that's subject to any more reviews and uh, uh, our typical pipeline safety law, even the ones that we just passed, it's now law. So the Keystone Pipeline's been uh, uh, been reviewed. Now I don't know where other people get their information. Let me ask some questions, though, of Ms. McCaffrey. Um, a number of what happens at the oil sands is uh, you're using cogeneration to uh, natural gas to uh, use to provide steam for the process in the in situ. Um, how many of the current oil sands sites are using cogeneration? I don't know the exact number, but I would guess that there's um, three or four that are doing it. But there are a lot more starting to uh, flag it as as a very viable way to go. And you mentioned in your testimony that technology undeveloped will largely large on reducing the steam to oil ratio in the uh, in situ operations. Uh, is that also uh, a process that's uh, being more expanded? Yes, so the industry is, is very, very focused on reducing uh, the steam to oil ratio and seeing great successes. And, and it, every quarter that goes by, you see improvements. There's other companies besides ourselves that are just putting great effort in as well. Is that natural gas produced somewhere close to the sites? Uh, it, typically, it's, it's in Alberta. It's quite often very close to the sites. Okay. So we don't have to worry about pipelines to, uh, to bring that natural gas to your well sites? Um, no, there's, there's uh, significant infrastructure in Alberta already. I know the issue is fresh water, even in Alberta. But, you know, in Texas, we obviously hydrofracking and it's been very successful, but it takes a tremendous amount of water. Um, what happens to the water? Is it most of it recycled? Yes, we recycle about 90 percent of it, and the r water we originally used is non-potable, so it's saltier water, and it's from deep uh, aquifers. We do not use any surface water, no rivers, no lakes in our operation. And what happens that 10 percent? And I'm referring to Neg and most of the operations in the south, towards the north, where it outcrops. Um, they do need to use the Athabasca River. Okay. Um, also. Uh, Ms. McCaffrey, in 2010, uh, Meg Energy Corp contribution to greenhouse power offset 238,000 tons of GHE production. Is that was based on the in situ oil sands alliance, or where did that number come from? Uh, that comes from our own operations, and uh, we are planning to put in more cogeneration co because of the benefits we see on, on our future phases right now. Okay. Uh, Mr. Smith? Uh, Ms. Uh, Massimo uh, writes in her testimony the government of Alberta actually allows the industry to self-report in this system where there's no independent third party uh, regulating. Is that true? The Energy Resources Conservation Board is an in independent regulator. Um, in fact, uh, you can go to a website today for the Department of Environment and see active air quality right live on real time, a real time basis. The maximum flow from the Athabasca River that the oil sands companies can extract in this development does not exceed 4%. Um, so there's uh, extensive water conservation, water management, and it's independently uh, regulated at, at this point through, okay. through the permit. I was wondering because our gas wells that we hydrofrack, obviously OSHA has access to those sites. 
and EPA has those uh, on, the, on the U.S. side. So I assume Alberta has some of the same government oversight regulations. You can send an inspector out and, and verify whatever is self-reporting that's being done absolutely, absolutely, yes. to verify that number. Um, Mr. Dyer, in your testimony, based on approved water licenses and fluent proposed, uh, current proposed projects, would they draw 15 percent of the Athabasca River flow during the lowest period, reducing fish habitat? If the producers are going to move to in situ production to order, in order to reach the resource, is if it's doing so, they're not going to use fresh water instead of using recycled water as a testimony. Uh, in your statement, uh, what was your basis for, ba and uh, quote, based on approved water license, the current, the 15 percent of the river's water flow? Uh, a basic uh, problem with your statement there, companies are not moving to in situ uh, oil sands development. Oil sands mining is expanding and is going to triple. It's just in situ development is actually expanding at a faster rate, so uh, we're still going to see three times the impact on the Athabasca River from, uh, from mines. It's just because there'll be more in situ. Okay. So well, you're talking about the strip mining. Yes, that's correct. Okay. But, Gentlemen. Mr. Chairman, I understand that 80 percent of the production is going to come from in situ and right. only 20 percent from the strip mining. Um, I understand. So. Yeah, that's correct, but we've only okay. produced 3 percent of the bitumen, okay. bitumen so far, so there'll be lots more cumulative effects for both mines. This and time I recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Bill Bray, for five minutes. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first of all, I guess there was need to clarify some uh, items that the representative from Greenpeace was able to bring up. Um, your concerns about uh, about oil or natural gas. Um, how about, does Greenpeace support corn ethanol and the use of corn ethanol in the mandates? I can't comment on that right now. Okay. How about the use of, uh, um, expanded use of uh, algae production for the, for That's the also not my study of expertise. No alternative fuels. Okay. Mr. Smith, I have some real questions. Uh, Somebody has been involved in the environmental movement one way or the other since 1970. I've just trying to think of a country anywhere than in the Western Hemisphere that has at least historically been perceived as environmentally sensitive. I cannot think of a country that at least the public perceives as environmentally sensitive than Canada. In fact, I remember Operation Canadian Bacon was the way we were going to attack you guys was we were going to throw trash into your, your parks. <laughs> I think, uh, Mr. Weber, we also said uh, we walk amongst you undetected. Uh, <laughs> and, and we worry about that. <laughs> Has Canada made such a huge shift from its history of being the environmental leader of the Western Hemisphere? Um, leader in uh, everything from, you know, from renewable resources to uh, greenhouse gas control. Uh, how can I sit here and believe that Canada has totally abandoned its standard of environmental protection that has historically been there and taken a walk on this issue? Has Canada been taken over by some evil foreign force and force you guys to have to uh, trash the environment? Uh, well, Honorable Member, um Canada and, uh, and resource producing provinces, of which there are now uh, six, um, have, have responsible in uh, permitting. They pay attention to changing environmental conditions. They pay attention to that triple bottom line of in environment, social values, and, and, and corporate profit. Uh, we've been able to weather a serious, serious recession because we do produce um, a great abundance of natural resources and natural minerals and, and, and products. Uh, we continue to uh, to clean up uh, uh, oceans and fish fisheries and air and ponds, uh, the Sydney tar ponds, for example. Uh, we have environmental re records of excellence. Um, I think that as we grow, we're going to continue to get to, to get better and better about uh, um, defining surface uh, surface reclamation. One of the issues is that we are transparent. We're not afraid to put our record out front have the discussion, have the debate, and where we can find need for change, we implement change. And it's not that anything has remained static, neither the development of the resource 
um, nor the uh, nor the regulations that that surround it. So it's an ongoing process. There is dynamic tension. We still import uh, in excess of 700,000 barrels a year on our east coast a day, and I believe that we can replace that with with oil sands crude. Once we do that, that oil sands crude will then go into eastern markets of Canada, and we'll also find a gateway to uh, to foreign uh, uh, foreign shipping. Uh, in fact, and I'd thank the uh, U.S. Uh, for permission to build that, or for Congress to give that permission to build that pipeline from Cushing to the uh, uh, Texas Gulf Coast because that's going to increase uh, your abilities for your refineries to use uh, Canadian crude and not crude from uh, hostile jurisdictions that uh, really want to take the money they gain from uh, selling uh, oil to you and use it against your, uh, your interests. Now, uh, I remember we were negotiating with um, Mexico about an oil line back in the 70s and the 80s, and there were those that stood in that way. That oil now, instead of being transported through a pipeline, is being transported through trucks and, and um, tankers. And actually, some of the, a lot of those tankers are going into Houston um, as we speak. Um, my, my question, though, is you, you pointed out, who is our... Who's Canada's number one trading partner in the world? You are. Who is America's number one trading partner in the we world? We are. So we are sort of tied together here um, from that aspect of it. My question, though, is um, it appears to me when I look at the Keystone Pipeline that the problem with the administration is not the EPA, is not the water quality control people. There's no controversy on that side. It comes down to a five-foot artificial barrier called the international border between Canada and the United States, and that the issue is not issuing the permit for you to bring a pipe up to your side of the border and for us to bring a pipe up to our side of the border. That's what's being held up here. So my question is, is it true to say that this issue really is not about the environmental impact in the United States, not the environmental impact on our water or resources in the United States, but more an issue about the United States trying to impose a, a regulation onto Canada and hold Canada to change its environmental policies and, and, um, and, th and that we will, the State Department, not the EPA, will not allow you to connect to a pipeline on our side unless you change uh, something on your side um, of the border. We are continuing to provide a, a safe, re secure, reliable, geopolitical, sensible um, stream of product to uh, a nation that needs the product desperately. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. This time I recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Olson, for five minutes. I thank the chair and welcome the witnesses. Um, I'm, I'm sorry here today because of election year politics. It was clear that something changed this past fall with the, with the President's handling of the Keystone XL pipeline. The Department of State wanted the pipeline. The labor unions wanted the pipeline. The environmental activists, the Hollywood elites, didn't want the pipeline. The President rolled and deferred the decision to pass the elections coming up this November. But one thing we've learned since that time is the Keystone XL pipeline is safe. Why else would the administration approve the first portion of it being built from my home state of Texas up to Cushing, Oklahoma, unless it was designed to be safe? Why would they do that? And the president still has an opportunity to do what's right for the economy, approve the full Keystone XL pipeline now. Unfortunately, he's still being misled by the environmental activists and the Hollywood elites. The Keystone Pipeline, not the XL Pipeline, but the sole Keystone Pipeline, already brings Canadian oil sands crude across the border, across that aquifer in Nebraska, and to Wood River in Potoka, Illinois. The exact same oil is flowing through a pipeline right now across the border to the United States. The protesters that surrounded the White House are waging a new war against Canada's oil sands. It's happened already. And as we heard from the witnesses today, Canada's oil sands present an incredible opportunity for American energy security. Coupled with White House Press Secretary Carney's admissions that we have world-class state-of-the-art refineries on the Gulf Coast, and that's a quote, we can ensure Americans have access to affordable energy for our children and our grandchildren. My first question is for you, Mr. Smith. 
Some claim that the Keystone XL pipeline is designed to ship oil from Canada through the United States to our again, quote unquote, world class state of the art refineries on the Gulf Coast and out to Asia. But if you simply look at a globe, you'd see that Canada's west coast is much closer to Shanghai than it is to Houston. And on that same globe, you might find a pipeline connecting Alberta to the Gulf of Mexico is a lot longer than a pipeline connecting Alberta to the Pacific. Why is the Keystone XL pipeline being proposed? Well, honorable member, I, uh, I was here when Keystone, Keystone One uh, was approved and had its presidential permit. Um, oil sands crude have, has been reaching markets in the United States uh, uh, since the 1980s. It uh, continues to grow. Uh, production continues to grow. It creates opportunities. It creates jobs on both sides of that of, of that border, and and I believe that ultimately we can have a North American answer to energy security and independence with reasonable priced energy prices that will stimulate economic recovery in, in both countries. How is building a pipeline through the U.S. an efficient means of accessing Asian markets? Each time you touch a barrel of oil, it becomes worth more money and uh, thereby more expensive. So if there's a market closer, that's where the shippers go. That's where the producers would like, would like to, to, uh, to provide, uh, provide that product. So it is a, a reach to think that you would move um, into, a, into a, a, a big ship that has um, a proclivity for a spill um, and it's also very expensive. So uh, I would be very surprised, uh, particularly in light of refinery closures on the northeastern side of the United States that oil reaching the, the uh, Texas refinery complex would go anywhere else but the United States of America. Yes, sir, thank you for that. One more question for you, Mr. Dahmer. We've heard from Mr. Smith on how Alberta achieved basically energy independence and the positive effects uh, that oil sands have had on their economy. And I saw a very similar thing in my home state of Texas about three weeks ago with the, the Eagle, Eagleford shale play. A little different source of energy, it's, it's true oil and true natural gas, but the exact, same's the exact same thing is happening in many cities across southeast Texas. I mean, very uh, underprivileged cities, underprivileged counties. One example in Dimmit County, the sales tax revenue has gone up uh, 300 percent. I'm sorry, three, yeah, 300 percent. The property tax revenue has gone up 400 percent, making a real difference in the quality of lives of those people in my home state. And I mean, if the United States had the same attitude towards oil shale, do we think we could have similar results across the country, not just what you experienced in Alberta and what we're experiencing in Texas? Um. Yes, a absolutely. Um, as I said in my tes testimony, uh, there are over uh, 30 companies working on oil shale uh, R&D here in the United States. And um, many of them have shown a lot of prof uh, promise. Uh, Shell is working, in situ, Chevron, Exxon, some of the larger companies are spending billions of dollars in trying to um, release the huge reserves that are locked in the Pionce Basin. Um, I think the problem we have here in the United States is we have no national program similar to the one that they put together in Alberta that directs the types of research and uh, development toward these resources. Um, we throw a, a programmatic EIS at it, we do oil shell regs, and then we revoke the oil shell regs, and then we do another programmatic EIS. Um, and that's why I brought up the fact that we have a, on the books a law, Section 369I, uh, that calls for a national program to develop these resources. And I think if we followed the precepts of that law, we would safely um, and comprehensively start to develop those resources. The reason why um, uh, Shell is having so many problems in Colorado is they have no assurance that they'll ever get out on the federal land. Yes, sir. You know, I'm so over my time. Mr. Chairman, I just want to thank expired. our witnesses from Canada as a former military veteran. Thank you for standing beside us in the war against terror. I know over 200 of your brave men who have given their lives beside us in Afghanistan. I really appreciate that. We'll stand behind, beside you. I yield back. This time I recognize the gentleman from New York, Mr. Engel, for five minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, I really have an open mind about this. Um, um, I, I believe uh, very 
uh, strongly that uh, the United States um, can never be totally free in our foreign policy and uh, uh, such similar matters unless we, we wean ourselves uh, uh, off of oil that we get from unfriendly nations. Uh, and I think that Canada certainly is the friendliest nation. So, so I, I, I think that there is, uh, is potential there, um, but I am concerned about the environmental uh, difficulties. Um, so I have a, just a couple of, of, couple of questions. Um, Canadian tar sands obviously aren't regular oil. They're highly corrosive and uh, very carbon intensive. And obviously, as lawmakers, we have to evaluate the immediate <coughs> health and environmental consequences of tar sands production, uh, weigh our obligations to leave fully functioning ecosystems for future generations, and consider our responsibility in terms of adding greenhouse gas emissions to our planet. Um, I take those responsibilities very seriously, and obviously, everything is a, is a, is a, is a balance. Um, in January 2012, Canada became the first nation to withdraw from the Kyoto Protocol. Now, we've never joined it, so in a way, people that live in glass houses shouldn't throw stones. But when, when Canada with, withdraws from it, um, I, I, I wonder why. It, it, it makes me uh, suspicious. Um, Every uh, oil sands developer claims they can clean up uh, the uh, production, Benjamin production with better technology, but from what I have seen, and please correct me if I'm wrong, this technology doesn't yet exist. And the hard truth is, from what I can see, the energy industry hasn't been really investing much in innovation. And I say this because, because according to Forbes, big energy companies devote barely 0.3% of their sales to research and development, and many have ended their R&D programs. And if the technology worked really well, it would use uh, less energy and steam over time to produce more bitumen. Uh, but exactly the opposite happened. In the late 1980s, uh, 2.38 barrels of steam was considered to produce a barrel of in-situ bitumen. And in 2010, the steam industry average increased to 3.3 barrels. So that's a 50% decline in efficiency over a 20-year period. So, I don't know, you look at the energy companies, um, they profit from commodity price increases, not ingenuity. So it's almost a disincentive uh, for them to come up with these things. So I'm concerned about development without proper fiscal, political, and environmental safeguards. And I'd be happy if anyone would want to comment on what I've, what I've just said, either people from the industry or, or, or others as well. Mr. McCaffrey. Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, just speaking from our own company's perspective, our, our numbers are we design our plant for a steam oil ratio of 2.8, which is the numbers you're referring to. We're currently at a 2.4. We are targeting to get down to 2. We're, we've got technology that we think is can be implemented now and that we're working on getting implemented to drive us in that direction. And some of the other um, companies in the area are also moving in that direction and they're being successful at it. So um, the technology that may have changed over time was would have been cyclic steam technology is now steam assisted gravity drainage and that's a far more efficient process and directionally uh, we are seeing good gains in that area. Mr. Dyer, didn't you in your testimony uh, uh, say that the tar sands are not getting cleaner and that technology is expensive and therefore that's the reason? Would you disagree with <coughs> what? what yeah, that's, the c that, that's correct. There have been uh, improvements since 1990, as I m mentioned, but in the past six years, we're starting to see uh, declining intensity. I think, uh, you know, if the industry is confident that uh, improvements still will still happen and uh, we have innovation there, uh, I think you would you'd see them embracing the ability to demonstrate that through regulation and through low-carbon fuel standards that would enable low-carbon fuels to, to compete. Let me ask this question, uh, and anyone who wants to answer it may. Um, what happens if these pipelines are not built? Will, will Canada continue to produce uh, tar sands or, or oil for the U.S. And, and Canada? Will it run out of customers before it runs out of, uh, of product? Um, what happens if this is not built? Mr. Smith? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Honourable Member. That, uh, yes, we'll continue to increase, pr uh, imp increase production in this, uh, in this process. Um, there will um, find alternate markets. Oil is a, per is a fungible commodity, which means it can be exchanged around the world on a, on a computer transaction or a, or a moment's notice. Um, 
and, and I believe that more and more of that will happen. Uh, they will find outlets for direct shipment either through the East Coast um, or, uh, or through the, there is a pipeline, the Kinder Morgan Trans Mountain Pipeline that was built by Bechtel back in the uh, 50s. That line has a corridor and can be uh, doubled in size uh, without, without great difficulty. That takes care of 400,000 barrels. Uh, 500,000 barrels can go to uh, Eastern Canada to replace uh, a foreign oil that we import. Um, so we can, we can find a market for a million, million plus barrels. It's also important um, to, to mention that we have received tens of billions of dollars of investment from sovereign owned com com companies from around the world, including China, Korea, um, and, uh, uh, and the, in the Middle East. So in fact, um, they are realizing that we have a fungible commodity. Uh, I just also want to uh, talk to uh, briefly, and Dr. Isaacs may want to supplement. Uh, we have a fund in Alberta that uh, has contributed over $230 million simply in the last three or four years to better improving technologies for greenhouse gas uh, reduction, energy efficiencies, and better, better practices in the oil sands. Uh, our surface disturbance in the oil sands today is about the size of uh, the city of Tampa. The uh, size of the oil sands deposit is about the si size of the state of Florida, and uh, we'll be reclaiming that, and I'm not sure that Tampa will ever get reclaimed. Um, so we have, we have a, a, a mine plan that goes forward every time, and they have to provide reclamation programs to get things back equal to or better than, which is the watchword of the Department of the Environment. Thank you. Thank the gentleman's you. time has expired. At this time, I recognize the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Griffith, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I guess I'm somewhat curious if the oil is going to be uh, oil sands going to be used anyway, even if we don't build the pipeline. Then I guess I, I, I'm, I'm kind of curious as to why all the opposition to the pipeline. And I'm wondering if any of you all can uh, start with Dr. Isaacs. Can you give me some explanation as to why, if the oil sands are still going to be uh, used, why someone would oppose this pipeline? coming into the United States. From a U.S. perspective, I know you all are mostly Canadians, but can you no, all understand that? No, I can't. I can't understand that. Can you understand that, uh, Mr. Danner? No, I don't understand that at all. Uh, Dr. Menninger? I'm sensitive to some of the issues, but um, I'm not sure that's the right way if, if you know, you're concerned about carbon emissions, that that really is effective. All right. Uh, Mr. McCaffrey? No, I don't understand it. Mr. Smith? We're already shipping 1.7 uh, million barrels south, and also uh, if I were receiving oil in the safe, I'd want it in the safest way possible in the newest infrastructure possible. Let me touch on that a minute, Mr. Smith. Uh, I, I've heard previous testimony that by shipping it the way that we're shipping it now into the United States, we actually have a bigger carbon footprint than if we build the pipeline. Is that accurate? Well, if, if you bring it in by tanker load, you'll actually, uh, the, when you go quantity to quantity, it'll be increased amount of emissions from tanker traffic than by pipeline. All right. And uh, you, you talked about safety as well. Is there more likelihood of accidents if you're doing the tankers? Well, it's your safety program, uh, honorable member, and it'll be a program, uh, be a pipeline built by Americans, supervised by Americans, and made safe by Americans. That includes union and non-union labor. All right. I appreciate that. Let me ask um, you as well, Mr. Smith. Um, it, you know, we always hear that the U.S. possesses only 2 percent of the world's uh, proven oil reserves. Now, we know that that's because proven reserve estimates only account for oil fields that are currently being produced. However, not long ago, Canada had a similar proven reserve figure to ours. Did your government accept that Canada's proven reserves in 1994 should mean that there should be no new oil exploration? Uh, no, it did not. Uh, uh, what, what it meant was that uh, we had to find a way to publicly um, quantify and qualify these reserves. The oil sands reserves are based on public record of 56,000 wells and 6,000 cores. Drilling records and core samples remain intact today and they can be viewed by anybody from this community. And I believe that much of the criticism that we get from the oil sands is our own fault because we're too transparent. We might be too apologetic. We might be too Canadian. Well, I, I'm not sure I'd go there, especially as an American. I don't want to 
accuse you of being too Canadian. <laughs> yeah, but what, you know, does this not say to us that the United States can learn that if we go out there and we look for new ways to discover new ways to use what we have in our country, that we can, we can in fact discover new ways to use what we have and come up with a greater percent than the 2% that uh, we always hear about, bandied about in the press uh, when the president tries to give us math lessons? One of the great things that Canada and the U.S. share is, is technology development, innovation, and germination between, uh, and pollination between companies. And whether it's horizontal drilling, uh, measurement while drilling, hydraulic fracking, fracking, production of gas from shales, production of liquids from shales, production of oil from shales, these technologies are shared across the border. The 49th parallel doesn't mean much when you're moving technology throughout. And I think that the Bakken field in uh, North Dakota is a a very good example of that. So you would generally agree with me that we probably have greater than 2% if only we'd use our resources. Yes, Is that sir. correct? Yes. Uh, Dr. Isaac, your, your testimony states that only in Canada are, are the only developed countries that can dramatically increase oil production. There are other parts of the world that are producing large amounts of oil and will exp experience some growth. But are any of the other countries in the world that are, that are expanding their growth are they committed to producing oil with comparable environmental sensitivities to that of the United States and Canada? I don't believe they are. And so would I be correct in believing that by not allowing the United States and Canada to expand our use of our natural resources, we may in fact be creating a greater problem worldwide with pollution than if we are allowed to use with our sensitivities to the environment are allowed to use our natural resources. Is that true? I think it's very possible, yes. I appreciate it, and I yield back my time, Mr. Chairman. This time, I recognize the gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Scalise, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks for having this hearing on the American Energy Initiative. I know this has been uh, a series of hearings that we've had on this, in addition to the legislation uh, that you've brought forward through this committee uh, to help our country become more energy independent and, and at the end of the day when we look at the skyrocketing price of gasoline and projections are it's only going to go higher I think most people recognize that supply does have a factor in price you can't ignore that that basic fact of economics and we've done a lot of things in this committee uh, not only to increase the supply in America to open up more areas that are currently closed uh, but also to create what would be hundreds of thousands of new American jobs that would go along with it and, uh, and, of course, here with the Keystone XL pipeline proposal, I know we've seen projections that on the low end, <clears throat> there would be 20,000 new jobs created, over $5 billion of private investment that would be brought in, not, not this federal stimulus program of spending money we don't have, but actual private investment to build this pipeline. Um, if, if, Mr. Smith, if you can address the jobs issue, because there have been some that have criticized that, uh, not enough jobs have been created or that the 20,000 number is not uh, accurate. I've heard it's even higher, but there's some suggestion it's lower, as if, as if only a few thousand new jobs is a bad thing. Uh, they oppose that. Uh, if you can address the jobs issue on, on what the estimates are that Keystone would create in America, the United well, States. What, what we do know is that uh, economic recovery is always based on reasonable energy prices or energy prices that are more competitive than... Uh, than the balance of, of world markets. Um, to construct that pipeline, it's my understanding that's a shovel-ready project, it requires no, uh, uh, no taxpayers' dollars. Um, and the number of direct and indirect jobs um, have been wildly debated. And uh, I believe that uh, uh, the number of 20,000 immediate jobs uh, in a country with 8.3% uh, unemployment would be significant. 20,000 immediate jobs. And in long term, what estimates do you have there? I think the long term is probably more difficult to calculate because as you move into economic recovery with reasonable and secure energy prices, uh, you do ramp up overall uh, uh, economic activity. So uh, I have heard in the range of 50,000 uh, indirects. Great. Um, and, you know, of course, some, including the president, are suggesting they need more time for environmental concerns and all of that. And, and of course, one of the facts that they leave out is that even if the president were to approve Keystone, which, you know, has been on his desk for, for over three years, and, and there have been, been environmental studies that have suggested it would be a positive thing to do, uh, each state would have to permit it. Each, even Nebraska, where you know, there's been a lot of attention given to Nebraska's route, uh, the state of Nebraska would still have to issue a permit 
uh, before the pipeline could be built, even if the president said yes, which, of course, the president has not. Is that correct? That's, that's my understanding. Yeah, and so, you know, as the president tries to say he's for an all of the above energy strategy, you're not for all of the above if you say no to Keystone and so many other things that we've seen him say no to. Um, as one final question as a follow-up to, uh, to what my colleague from Virginia asked on this 2%, because uh, I know the president said this, others have suggested that uh, in America there's this finite 2% uh, amount of all the world's known reserves, and of course in Canada they were using similar numbers, even going back to 1994 numbers, before, of course, some of the new technologies came out. And, and as many know, you, you know that, that known number of reserves only counts where there's actual production. If you're shutting an area off to exploration, there could be vast amount of reserves that are there. We just don't know about them because the federal government won't let them go there. How did you all address that in Canada when you, when you had a similar kind of smaller number of known reserves before the new technologies were allowed to advance? Uh, well, Honorable Member, that's an important distinction. Uh, the, uh, the resources are managed by each individual province slash state, if you will. Uh, they have an independent jurisdiction, um, and the uh, federal government is basically forbidden by uh, the Constitution to, to interfere in the orderly development of those resources or the, uh, uh, the trade and commerce of, of uh, the provinces with those resources. So uh, we found, uh, my direct experience was, um, transparent records, uh, environmental uh, surveillance, um, a keen and, and, and strict regulatory process, uh, and an ability to communicate that uh, throughout uh, the jurisdiction. Um, even with, with this great amount of debate, uh, continually polls across uh, Canada support the orderly development of the oil sands. Well, thanks. And, and final question, Mr. Caffrey. Um, the, if you look at Canada's oil field discovery, it increased their proven reserves by an order of magnitude of, of multiple times over. Uh, can you, can you kind of give a, your, your commentary on how this was accomplished? I think it's through the uh, advancement of technology. We've continued to see uh, incredible improvements in terms of the recovery factors and, and being able to demonstrate those recovery factors. And I think it really echoes the point of the sheer size of that resource that is re commercially recoverable. And we have a large number of customers in the U.S. right now in the, on the Gulf Coast and uh, that are very interested in connecting with the supply. So as this supply has come on, as it con continues to improve in efficiencies, there, there's a vast majority of the uh, refineries on the, on the Gulf Coast that are, have come up on a regular basis saying we need the crude, we've got to get the crude. And that's the only thing is the pipeline that is, is preventing the customer from getting the supply it needs. Well, thank you all for coming, and thanks, Mr. Chairman. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Scalise, and I want to thank uh, those members of the panel for being here today. We appreciate your testimony very much, and I do think that this hearing brought to a clear focus the difference policies in Canada and in the U.S., and because of Canada's policies, they've gone from a net importer to a net exporter, and we recognize that there are many groups who sincerely do want to stop the exploration, production, and use of fossil fuels, but the reality is uh, for our transportation needs, we don't have any alternative right now. So uh, this, this hearing has really been helpful, and we appreciate your expert uh, testimony. And uh, with that, I'll adjourn this hearing, and we'll keep the record open for uh, 10 days for any materials that need to be admitted. Thank you.